Linux and there's no need to um, think of any other operating systems. There are, of course, uh, alternatives. I can't think of one from the top of my head. It had something to do with uh, things you can look through, but um, I don't remember. Um, the left part of the figure, so let me see how I can change color in my very um, innovative approach of displaying information. The left part of the figure, so this one here, the network node, um, is the uh, class of system that interests me in this talk. So that systems with uh, that still are 32-bit capable. Of course, there are also users of uh, eight or 16-bit systems, and maybe these uh, there are even operating systems that support such eight or 16-bit uh, systems. But these, I firmly believe, will really be um, part of the past in the not so distant time in the future. Um, we're talking about clock speeds well below 500 megahertz. We're talking about megabytes of non-volatile storage. And for RAM, I've said here it's less than eight megabytes. There are arguments in the Linux kernel community that you can actually trim down a kernel to less than eight megabytes, which you comfortably can do. But uh, at some point, the question um, rises, you need to strip away so much stuff of Linux that it basically becomes something fundamentally different than Linux, and so there's not much point in using it in the first place. So uh, for me, the, um, the boundary between the non-Linux and the Linux domain is this eight megabytes of RAM. So um, stripping down Linux, there's of course some opinions in the community. If you ask the network maintainer that came up in a thread like one and a half or so years ago, um, um, uh, he was asked when people discussed if we should provide Linux for the Internet of Things or not, what parts of Linux would you remove to get the footprint down for a two megabyte single purpose machine? Uh, and his answer was very simply, I wouldn't use Linux End of story, maybe two decades ago, but now those days are over. There's, of course, some disagreement about this in the kernel community, but I tend to agree with this statement. If you strip down Linux beyond a certain size, that's not necessarily two megabytes, but four or eight megabytes, it simply stops becoming Linux. So you have um, your, um, your uh, maintenance efforts will be so high with the stripped down um, versions your programming model will be so different. You don't have all the device drivers you're used to. You don't have all the core kernel infrastructure that you're used to that it's maybe called Linux, but it's um, just something different than Linux. So that's a reasonable point of view. Now, if we say um, we need a different operating system than Linux, of course, the question is what to pick. Um, and the Linux community also has some opinion in that regard, so from the um, Linux kernel tinyfication efforts, frequently asked questions. Uh, there's the statement, Linux has a lot more long after and generality than most embedded operating systems. Most such operating systems are proprietary. All of them lack the range of capabilities, drivers, and general level of code quality and review found in Linux. So um, being modest has, I guess, never been one of the defining uh, properties of the Linux kernel community. And they also say most of them have far smaller communities or no communities at all, which is quite a statement. So let's um, spend um, a few minutes looking at, oh, uh, and actually, so Weltanschauung, I really like the world uh, Weltanschauung. It's your um, point of view that you take, um, how, um, or that you, how you think the world does look like. Of course, Germans have a word for everything, and Weltanschauung is, is one of these words that are barely un, uh, that are basically untranslatable into anything different unless your mindset runs on German. But um, Weltanschauung need not necessarily be true. So let's um, compare Weltanschauung and veracity of these statements. So of course, many parts of Linux, and I guess I I uh, don't need to bring all to Athens here are indeed of very high quality. That's without no debate. But this also comes um, this also comes at the price. If you remember how hard it was to build Linux systems 10 years ago or 15 years ago embedded systems, if you wanted to um, attach another input source to a system that was basically very easy 10 years ago, these days you have to deal with layers and layers and layers of abstractions. You have to go through input abstraction layers. You have to go um, through devices. You have to configure and reconfigure your kernel. You have to deal with 
uh, things like SystemD, you have to deal with automatic um, device generation that's supposed to work most of the time, but then um, doesn't most of the time. So we have, um, we've see, we're seeing a tremendous complexity that um, comes with this um, very high quality and generality of systems, and the question is, is this really necessary? Plus, um, the Linux community may be big, but if you look into corner cases, corner cases in inverted commas like real time that are um, quite crucial to many internet of things and data acquisition solutions, then the sizes of the community actually are not that large. So I guess it's, it's uh, safe to say that, for instance, the preempt RT extensions to the Linux kernel are maybe understood by three or four people in the world in uh, the full generality, but not much more. If you look into approaches, extensions like Xenomai and so on, then it's a community of two or three people that drives these efforts. And that is actually not much more than, or even less than many uh, proprietary or uh, competing operating systems have. Uh, another perception is according to LWN.net, which usually um, reports quite, um, quite um, true and interesting stuff, is that a growing kernel makes it hard for people who are trying to build tiny system, forcing them to go to a proprietary real-time operating system instead. So again, we have our black and uh, white Weltanschauung, that's quite popular at Linux. Um, so if it's not Linux, then it's proprietary, and if it's proprietary, then it's of course bad. I do agree with um, the second part of the statement, but um, I, do not dis I do not agree with the first part of the statement. So if you look uh, beyond your Linux realm, you realize there's actually a lot of alternative real-time operating systems, embedded operating systems that are available in open source form. Uh, that's Artems, Ecos, Contiki, Riot, Embed, Free, Artos, Musi, Linux, Fredex, and uh, tons more Bitfunder. I would not, and of course still there are some proprietary operating systems, but I'd say it's much harder to actually find a proprietary operating system, a small operating system these days, than it is to find um, an open source one. So there's quite some um, misperception in the Linux community in this respect. Also the statement that these systems have no communities at all couldn't, um, I wouldn't say couldn't be further from the truth, but it's not quite what you see when you look at the numbers. Um, so I did this comparison a while ago. You see the numbers go to January 2015. Actually, I wanted to update the numbers for this talk, but um, I was comparing postings on mailing lists uh, over time. And when I wanted to update the numbers, um, of course, the G main archive went down and with it all the um, the glorious statistics that you could get from them. So um, maybe things have changed. Um, during the last year, but I don't expect that in any case. Sorry for um, providing you with old numbers. What I just compared very quickly is the amount of postings on the Artems mailing lists, on the mailing lists of the relatively new Riot um, IoT operating system and on specialized mailing lists for preempt RT. And as you can see, Artems, so the green line and the Riot, the blue line, actually have much higher volume of discussion on their lists than preempt RT. So, in fact, uh, you can't really say there are no communities at all. They are, of course, smaller than the Linux communities, but there are quite substantial communities, and um, these operating systems are really alive. Okay, so um, after this um, debunking some myths section about um, non-Linux operating system, let me come to some of the conceptual differences between um, the Internet of Things operating systems and traditional Linux-based um, embedded systems. And what you see here is not an empty slide, but that's a, a template slide to adapt the content of the talk to the, um, to the audience's expectations. So um, I heard that many of you have um, already quite a lot of uh, experience in developing non Linux embedded system, so I guess I will shorten this um, technical part a bit. What I, um, what I wanted to, to show is basically um, the, is the basics of non-MMU, non-process um, um, non supporting operating systems. Well, let me go uh, through that quickly. As you all know, in Linux, we have our beloved um, address spaces, so we have 
on a we especially don't have a working back mechanism on this non-Linux uh, Internet of Things device. But well, so we have um, an address space and a 32 gigabyte system that provides us with four gigabytes of RAM. And in Linux, of course, we have our distinction between kernel space, here roughly speaking, in the uh, top gigabyte of the virtual address range, and we have all our user space payload code in the uh, bottom three gigabytes of the address space. For multiple applications, for multiple tasks that run on the system, we have, uh, thanks to the uh, capabilities of the memory management units, multiple of these virtual address spaces, each with its own um, um, range for the kernel, but this uh, and um, each, uh, its own range for the uh, for the application payload. But these uh, two applications are separated by the processor, as I guess you all know, and cannot interfere with each other. So it's a very good um, um, virtualization mechanism in the sense that every process sees its own copy of the hardware. That's um, usually not the case in um, deeply embedded operating systems and IoT operating systems. Um, for one thing, um, kernel, the distinction between deeply embedded, the distinction between kernel and user land, of course, gets less important. Both kernel code and user land code run in the same uh, privilege level of the CPU, so you have the kernel lying around in RAM somewhere. You have one user land application lying around in RAM somewhere. You have another user land application lying around in RAM somewhere. And um, the user land application basically could touch the kernel memory uh, whenever it wants. The user land application can touch the memory of other applications whenever it wants, which of course brings uh, some changes to the way how you think about your software architecture, your software design. Uh, but when, basically, this uh, um, sounds more um, more disturbing than it actually is. If your applications behave well, if they only touch memory that they're supposed to touch, that they have allocated, if they don't try to meddle with the um, hardware details of the system too much, then basically you won't see any difference, except that, of course, you need to think more about what resources you use in the first place instead of just allocating as much as you can get and then use it. Okay, moving on from that, um, here's my, my next templatized slide. Um, when it comes to small uh, embedded systems, they are usually real-time operating systems, and that's one of the most uh, fundamental differences between IoT operating systems and um, embedded Linux. As you all know, embedded Linux is an interrupt-driven system, which means when you look at how time progresses, in the system, some application is running, application A, then it's uh, something, some external event happens to the system, an interrupt is raised, um, the CPU is notified that some external activity has happened, then Linux transitions from user mode to kernel mode, processes the interrupt in the kernel, maybe a network packet has arrived, maybe a key was pressed, on a keyboard attached to the system, maybe some sensor delivered data, the kernel somehow satisfies the needs of the devices of the device um, raising the interrupt and then goes back um, to executing the user land application. Let's say here we switch from application A to application B because its time slice has, uh, has expired when application B has used up its time budget, it's then time to execute an application C, then another interrupt may come in triggers a transition to kernel mode, and so on. Um, guess not much need to tell you more details about that since you all seem to be very well aware of it. The fundamental difference um, um, for most um, IoT systems is that um, an interrupt-driven system is generally very hard to get right. So there's in a throughput-oriented system, um, no real alternative to that. But the much simpler way of looking at systems is to assign the uh, computational resources up front and not use this interrupt-driven design where basically things can happen in 
um, some completely unpredictable order that um, cannot be planned ahead. But you can use a, a deterministic schedule. You can say, okay, be, even before running the system, I know that this application needs about 30% of the CPU time, this needs 20%, this needs 10%, and then you'd, um, um, then you partition your available time in a fixed raster. You say, okay, we have here um, certain temporal intervals, and I always give uh, these first two intervals to application A, then application B gets the next time interval, then application C gets the next time interval, and so on, which simplifies um, scheduling actually quite a lot because you don't need to dynamically keep track of um, um, dependencies between processes. You don't need to keep um, track um, of different priorities of processes. Um, you don't even need to care much about external events in the most extreme case because if your application cyclically uh, will get CPU time anyway, you can just then at this point check if there was any external interruption, if any data has been supplied by some external device and then do the processing then and it doesn't really matter if this, um, if this is immediately coupled to the cause of the interruption or not. Why um, small embedded system take this approach is clear. The whole scheduling code, which is a tens of thousands of lines in Linux and requires quite extensive data structures, basically is boiled down to a few very simple lines of code. Okay, moving on uh, to my, what I think, yeah, is my, my final um, template slide. Another major difference between embedded Linux and IoT type operating system is the way how you build appliances. With an embedded Linux box, as you all know, you install some sorts of distribution on the device that can be some embedded Debian, that can be provided by the Yocto project, that can be based on Elvis. So there's um, a tremendous amount of possibilities um, for, for doing that. But in the end of the day, you have some storage on the embedded system that contains a kernel, your base distribution, you can access the system via some communication mechanism, be that SSH, be that a simple terminal connection, and the software that you actually upload to the target is quite variable. So you upload a binary, you run that, you exchange that binary, you run, run something different that makes updating um, very easy, that makes uh, dynamic provisioning of the systems very easy. But um, the crucial point is you build or building your system is very much decoupled from building your actual applications. Even if you do that as part of the same distribution mechanisms, it's two completely different entities. Uh, with Internet of Things operating systems, what you usually build um, and deploy on your machine is one big binary blob, so one, uh, one application file or app, as I have learned this is call this day and the app um, contains, of course, your payload code, uh, maybe plus the description of how many tasks you want on the device, of how your scheduling um, time should be distributed and so on, and that's packaged together with the kernel, so that forms one, one entity that you then put on your device that runs and then gives you a very much more static system setup that you get with most um, embedded Linux appliances. Uh, there's one quite interesting legal point to that type of setup when you bind the kernel and your user land uh, payload code together, which is, of course, quite obvious to anyone who is aware of the problematics of OSS licensing, who is aware of the problematics of linking and so on. But what we've seen quite often in the wild is that people do not really uh, explicitly take care of, um, do not really explicitly consider that or are so used to embedded Linux development uh, that they don't see any coupling between the kernel and between their uh, payload, uh, yeah, payload um, application code. And that's because, of course, um, in Linux, when you transition from kernel to the user land, you do that with a syscall, you don't do that with um, static linking. So there is effectively a license barrier involved in every Linux system that decouples the license, the GPL license of the kernel. 
from the license that you uh, want to put your payload code under, be that a proprietary license, be that something different. Now, if you go to these IoT type operating systems and combine, combine user land code or payload code, yeah, you can't really call it user land code because it runs in kernel mode, combine your payload code with um, the kernel code, then this license barrier, this system call barrier goes away. And in the worst case, depending on the actual license that the embedded operating system has, depending on the uh, license obligations that the system imposes on you, that means that uh, you could even go up to inheriting the code of your license, uh, the code of your operating system for the code of your um, payload applications. And we've I've seen, I've seen instances of cases where companies wanted to keep their code proprietary, but were actually forced to publish their uh, their source code because of these linking issues, because the uh, GPL-like licenses of the embedded operating systems require them to do so. That's, of course, um, the worst case, but if you haven't considered that, if you're coming from a strict Linux background and haven't considered that, then I do really pay attention to that. That's, of course, something you don't want to have. Um, coming from the difference to the communalities, um, if you're doing development for these um, IoT type operating systems, then there's still a lot of stuff that's very similar to when you do Linux application development. So you use the same, use the same tool chains um, for most of the IoT class systems. GCC is the tool chain of choice. You do, um, you do cross build your application so you don't build on your device that sometimes happens for embedded Linux, but that's, in my opinion, not really the same choice. Um, you use the same build systems, you use the same version control mechanisms, you even use the same debugging mechanisms, so it doesn't really make much of a difference if you uh, use um, an ADB debugger and um, ADB bridge and pass it to GDB, or if you use a traditional GDB server on your device, or if you use GDB server on um, a deeply embedded device, that's Everything in the end of the day in the front end, the very same thing. What's also important is most of these IoT class um, embedded um, um, operating systems use C or C++ as the major programming language. There are, of course, exceptions. You can also get uh, Lua-based operating systems um, in the device range I'm talking about, but most of them are based on C++. And even if um, these systems don't support POSIX, a POSIX API, um, and many of them, in fact, don't. That's not so much of a difference than one would initially uh, expect, because if you look at your code and think about how much is really POSIX and how much is standard C, then standard C outweighs um, the uh, POSIX elements, usually by orders of magnitude. Plus, um, POSIX is by far not the only, um, the only library, the only interface specification that you use in moderately complex applications, you have anyway tons of libraries that have nothing whatsoever to do with POSIX. And um, in a way, if you see the, um, the API of the IoT operating system is just another library, then um, programming the system is then not much else than picking up, learning a new library for standard embedded Linux development. Okay, so from that, um, moving on to different properties of um, different qualities of IoT type um, operating systems. Of course, um, in a um, 45 minutes talk, there's not enough time to go into detail for any of these operating systems. And the um, selection I'm presenting you is, of course, based on a fairly lengthy evaluation that we did with the different systems. We looked at them, we looked at their source code quality, we looked at um, their maturity, we looked at how many architectures, how many drivers they support and so on. But um, in the end of the day, it's a bit my subjective, um, my subjective insight into this. Um, I've compared three Artos, Artems, Musi Linux, Embed, and Sapphire. Um, and yeah, basically, there's not so much to say about this table. I guess it's quite self-explanatory. Um, when you pick an operating system for your uh, for your projects, you know yourself 
what's most important for you? Do you want a really mature operating system? Is it important for you that you have comprehensive driver support because your hardware varies so much? How much emphasis do you put on documentation quality because this varies quite wildly? And uh, most importantly, how many resources in terms of RAM, in terms of storage, can your, um, can your device provide? And then this table may be a good starting point for you to look um, into more uh, into a system in more details. Uh, a few things about the uh, candidate systems that we've surveyed. So Artems is the real-time executive for multi-processor system. That's a decade-old system stemming uh, from, um, from military um, use cases. Uh, the most aligned points that can be said about this system is that it has a really comprehensive support for CPU architecture. So we're talking about similar support than the Linux kernel provides, even if it's, of course, much lesser known. But basically, there's no architecture, um, no reasonable architecture on the market that you won't find um, support in Artems for. It also has fairly comprehensive support for different development boards. Um, it's actually sometimes a bit hard to judge if they say that the board is supported and if a board is really supported. So um, the documentation regarding what, what maybe has been supported in some ramshackle way or another 10 years ago and what is really supported is bad, but still overall their list is, is quite impressive. And uh, if you come from a more traditional background, there, is, there are commercial vendors, at least two commercial vendors involved in the development of Artems. You don't hear this argument about um, geeks and hippies building um, Linux system much these days anymore, but now people start the same argument uh, with the non-Linux systems. That's all just um, geeky stuff, and so we cannot use that in our precious um, commercial development. But at least this system, you really have good, solid commercial vendors uh, who can provide support. It's also very easy to transition from embedded Linux to Artems because you have POSIX support up to two uh, minor differences. You don't have, um, you don't have a virtual address basis, so you, of course, don't have a fork, exec, and so on systems calls provided by POSIX, but 99% um, of the POSIX standards are covered by Artems. You have uh, Berkeley socket support, so if you have a traditional network application, then it's also just a matter of recompiling it for Artems. You have different networking stacks um, in the system, one of FreeBSD that's a little bit larger and the lightweight IP networking stack, that's a very compact networking stack. And uh, you even have support for memory protection units. Um, so we, which is a, um, kind of in between, between full MMU, full task support and having a single address space, but making sure by processor mechanisms that uh, applications cannot interfere so much with each other. Um, Free Artos is another more or less hybrid between the, um, uh, the, the architecture of a standard embedded Linux system and an IoT system. You do have virtual address space support in the system, so it supports MMUs. You can have tasks uh, that are separated by the very same mechanisms as they are in embedded Linux. The major difference is that you can really strip down the system, so it's a highly config configurable system. You can strip it down to a few kilobytes of RAM, so if you look at, um, at their um, source code, at the details, they count the amount of bytes that you need to, they count the amount of memory that you need to support another process on your system in bytes, so in Linux that's, we're not exactly talking about megabytes, but, but quite some, um, some substantial amount of memory just for um, keeping the, um, the data structures in RAM that are used to, um, to represent a task in free orders, you're talking about bytes. It also has um, a number of TCP IP stacks, Berkeley socket, it has a Berkeley sockets API. Um, the major drawback I see with free orders is that it has a very small community, which is quite astonishing because it's fairly popular in many embedded projects. But if you look at the community closer, um, I'm, yeah, I cannot discuss um, the, de the, uh, the details here for time reason, but it's astonishingly few people, and so that's, of course, your choice if you want to trust such a small community or not. In that case, the argument about Linux being so much more um, stable in terms of community does apply. Coming to embed, uh, that's a very nice alternative 
when you're doing first time deeply embedded development. So they have um, uh, an SDK that's as far away from POSIX as could be. Uh, that can be a good thing or can be a bad thing, depending on how you see it. Um, it's also mostly based on C++, so it's a very nice opportunity to get all these developers that uh, don't have the natural habitat in the kernel area, that don't routinely use um, eye surgeon instruments to shift bits around in CPUs to embedded programming because they can work um, in an environment that they are used to. They can work with languages that more represent the uh, train of uh, the school of thought they have. And um, especially, I learned that it's, or I, um, it's very popular for students that maybe have been born after the 1990s because these guys all want web stuff. They want uh, web browser support. They want ideally program the uh, devices in Facebook and you need to, <laughs> you need to take uh, care of this somehow. So Embed has a very nice web-based development environment where you don't need to fiddle around with all the uh, cross-compiler issues with all the debugger issues and so on. You just compile your programs in, um, in the web-based environment. And what's the most fun part about ARM Embed is you have the uh, embed hardware development kit, so that provides schematics for reference devices, that these devices basically have um, USB connectivity, you attach them to your computer and then they show up as MOS storage components or as a USB flash drive. You drag and drop your application to your MOS storage device, then it's flashed onto the device and when you unplug it, you have um, reprogrammed the thing that is of course, very scary to a uh, traditional embedded guy that wants to use his 25,000 euro Lauterbach uh, debugger to flash his stuff exactly where he wants it to be. But um, once you've gotten used to that, it's actually a quite interesting thing of um, equipping deeply embedded systems with code. Good, Sapphire, final thing um, on my list. That, of course, has not the ARM Embed uh, logo, as I just realized. Maybe I should, um, I should exchange that. It's a, a, a comparatively novel approach by the Linux Foundation, novel in terms of when it was published. The source code history, if you look into the repositories, goes much, much further. It's been based on um, an old proprietary operating system, and that's a really nice alternative if you're used to the um, Linux kernel style of programming, if you're used to the Linux kernel build system, so it reuses all that from the Linux kernel as a cable-based um, build system, you feel immediately at home even, uh, when it comes to coding standards and so on. Plus, it's a good choice when you want to go to really, really small systems. So talking about a few kilobytes, 8, 16, uh, 32 kilobytes of RAM, it has two kernels, a nano kernel, and a microkernel, the nanokernel is basically um, this uh, simple scheduling loop uh, that you usually write with your own custom operating systems that I was talking about in the beginning. You have a single task, you have interrupt service routines, but not much more. You have non-preemptive cooperative multitasking and the microkernel then goes a bit further. You can actually specify multiple tasks yeah, thought of preemptive multitasking, but you're still m much, much away from standard embedded Linux. Okay, so my time uh, basically is already up. <laughs> what I wanted to show you in the last part of the talk, but that, that doesn't make uh, much of a difference, is how to do um, an exemplary embedded development process with RTEMS. Um, I'm going to skip quite quickly over that. The main argument that I wanted to make with RTEMS is this is, of course, just a, a Hello World program, but it shows the essential things. You write your normal C code. You don't have a main function. You have some, um, some, um, some different initialization function, but you can write C code as you're used to it. You use a standard POSIX environment, more or less. You use standard libraries. You then specify, in contrast to a standard embedded Linux system, what the actual properties of your system will be. Do I need a console? Do I need networking? How many tasks do I need? And so on. And with a bit of uh, preprocessor magic, then uh, the system knows what to generate. So I've listed um, quite explicit steps that you can re bike at home, how to uh, build an embedded appliance based on RTEMS. I'm not going um, into details here, of course. The executive summary is that this feels exactly like embedded Linux programming failed 15 or 20 years ago. You really start from the scratch. You really build everything yourself for your appliance. But that, in some 
instances is much more convenient in my opinion because you really know what you did. So you don't face this tremendous complexity that you see with embedded systems these days, but you go back to really um, getting full control over your devices and knowing what you actually run. Um, and the final argument that I wanted to make is um, RTEMS is a very good support for a um, yeah, target PC386, a standard x86 target. And this target works very well in combination with QMU. So once you build your system images, you get a file, some .exe file, so which is of course not a Windows executable, but an RTEMS executable that combines the kernel and the user land portion. And using QMU, you can run that basically like any other userland application that you run on Linux. The, um, the best thing about that is QMU has very good integrated debugging support for operating systems. So you're not debugging the application in the case of RTEMS binaries, you're debugging the operating system. But that, as I've shown you, since this is all in one single package, is actually the application. You specify that minus s command line argument to QMU and then uh, can just open the combined operating system payload uh, executable with GDB as you would every other user space, a uh, regular user space operation you attach to your um, remote target. That's running on your system, of course, but that doesn't make much of a difference. And then you can debug your application in very much the same way as you do debug um, your standard embedded Linux application. So there's essentially not much much difference these days if you use systems like RTEMS in developing IoT class applications and Linux class applications. And um, the commonalities between these two worlds are much more pronounced than um, typical IoT vendors, typical IoT systems would usually make you think. So if you, I, I did a little experiment with the students and if you don't really tell them what they're doing, if you just give them a make file, if you just tell them, yeah, don't run the binary directly, use uh, this and that command line switch to uh, run it in QMU and then do your debugging, then they don't, um, some of them don't even realize that they are now not running an application, but they're running uh, basically a complete virtual machine with an operating system with a completely different environment than they're used to. So uh, with that time's up, I'm not going to talk about uh, how to build appliances or how easy that is with these operating systems and do thank you for your interest. <laughs> Any questions maybe? I guess we have time for one or so. Actually, I had, I had Contiki on my list, but I removed it because um, when I was doing the comparison, um, you come across so many apples and peas because Contiki is so much focused on extremely low memory consumption and doing everything different and other systems on using a um, completely different approach to networking that I was afraid that I wouldn't have enough time to talk about these differences and do an unfair comparison and that I guess has actually turned out to be true. Okay, good then. Uh, thanks again and I'll be around if you want to talk to me. <laughs>